you very much uh, for joining us for uh, today's very special event uh, where we are going to continue our marking of Black History Month uh, by having a couple of very, very special guests. Um, with me are Ed and Duncan Finlayson, uh, who are both uh, grandsons of a gentleman by the name of Edward Tull Warnock. Um, who is a name that uh, you're going to be um, hopefully much more familiar with by the time we finish this particular um, interview uh, than you are at the moment. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, he was one of the very first uh, registered black dentists in the United Kingdom. We believe he may even have been the very first, but he's somebody who's clearly very, very special as the first black man or one of the very first black men to be registered as a dentist in uh, in this country. Uh, and as a crucial figure who perhaps hasn't had as much attention paid to him uh, over the years as he should have done. You might be familiar with his brother, um, Walter Toll, who uh, is somebody who we spoke about uh, at length uh, in previous years here, uh, someone who was the uh, one of the very first uh, black men uh, to play uh, international football uh, and was also someone who gained uh, honours uh, militarily um, as well as a black man, which is something which was not uh, the done thing uh, back at the time when he served uh, in the forces. But I'm going to introduce our two guests first of all. As I say, we have two very, very special gentlemen, Ed and Duncan Finlayson. So, Ed, if you just wanted to maybe uh, uh, introduce yourself to people so that they can just find out a bit more about you before we begin in earnest. Okay. Um, well, first off, we would say thank you very much for the opportunity to have a conversation about uh, my grandfather, Edward. Um, as is obvious, I'm named after him. Uh, so, sadly, I, I didn't know him. He died in December 1950, and I was born in March 1951. Um, one of the key elements that I seem to have inherited from him that no other sibling uh, has done so is an interest in golf. So I'll, uh, I'll come back to that. But uh, Edward was a great golfer, amongst many other attributes. So I'm his grandson and very proud to be so. Uh, and I agree with your introduction uh, as a family. We're very honored about the interest in Edward's younger brother, Walter Tull, there has been over the years and how his life has been remembered. But as I've grown older, I've increasingly, as you suggest, Wayne, asked myself the question, what was life like for Edward, uh, a black dentist in Glasgow? Um, in such an intimate profession, too. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the discussion this morning. Thank you. Fabulous. And for, your, uh, for yourself, Duncan, what about your reflections? Uh, well, without reiterating everything Ed said, um, again, I don't really have a strong or any recollection that I could be sure of uh, I was just about three, I think, when he died. I do have this um, image of him and of a kind of a location when I saw him, but I think it's probably, in my mind, an amalgamation of photos that I've seen of him and uh, memories of the house. But uh, as, as Ed said, the focus often has been and understandably on his, his brother Walter and they were very close uh, and a remarkable pair of men um, but I think uh, again as probably Ed said Edward's story is probably equally remarkable in its own way. Yeah. Okay so for, for either of you or for both of you um, obviously growing up when was it uh, or how soon uh, were you made aware of these two remarkable men uh, who are such an important part uh, of your uh, of your timeline? At, at what sort of ages do you re first recall um, having stories given to you or any reflections given to you? Ed, if you want to answer that one. Well, yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I can't give a, an age, but I would say from the earliest age that I could remember, um, in other words, we were always made aware of our Bayesian, Barbadian uh, 
uh, background. Um, uh, my earliest memory is of a photograph of Edward that sat on the top of the piano. Uh, and to be honest, as a child, I always thought he looked quite severe and serious. Uh, and it's only in more recent times when I've taken a keener interest in his life and the kind of person he was that I realized that's completely contrary to the, the man that was full of fun and good humor. Um, so that's one of my earliest rec recollections. Um, and of course, the other one does relate to his younger brother because as a kid growing up to know that we had a grand uncle who played for Spurs. Well, you know, what can you say? Uh, so we were always aware, uh, I was always aware of a that side of the family's history. Not in the detail that I understand it now, of course. Mm -hmm. And Duncan, was that the same for you as well growing up? Yes, a, our grandmother came to live with us when we were quite young after she lived independently for a bit after my grandfather died, but then she came to live with us. So we're always very conscious, you know, um, of our grandfather uh, and who he was. Uh, but probably quite superficially in terms of kind of photos and, and, you know, from what our mother told us about him. And the fact that he was a dentist and these kind of details. And again, uh, as Ed was saying, our focus, certainly as I grew up, probably um, our focus moved to Walter because uh, the fact that he had played for Tottenham Hotspur gave you bragging rights in school. You know, we would tell about our our famous uh, grand uncle. And again, it's, it's interesting because I think as I've grown up, I've kind of um, even in that story, I've kind of moved away from the football aspect and moved more towards his kind of military career, which we didn't quite focus on when we were younger, I think. So, but certainly Edward has always been kind of in the background there as a kind of image um, and a, a person of, of note, I think, in terms of the fact that, a, as I say, he was, a dentist and a, a black dentist nonetheless in Glasgow and and had a very successful practice from what we understand yeah could I could I just add I'm thinking about it the other early memory I have is these dental instruments that were on mum's dressing table <laughs> she kept the dental mirror and the pick um I, I've no idea of what she used them for but uh, that's one of my early memories is uh, this dental pick and the dental mirror that as far as i recall sat in her dressing table or in a wee bowl in her dressing table yeah yeah and do you know much uh, of the relationship that the two of them had between one another and what it was that drew one towards sport uh, and then the military and then one towards um, the health uh, professions towards dentistry do you know much of that either of you I think it goes back to the story of their kind of early life um, in that they were both after the death of their their mother and then subsequently their father, they both were put into care. Um, a very progressive, I have to say, um, home or uh, care home in Bethnal Green in, in London run by, I think, uh, a Methodist who had, as I say, very progressive ideas in terms, for, for those days, and, and I think it, it, it even in present day bears consideration. And then, of course, subsequently after that, Edward was adopted by the Warnock family in Glasgow. They, he was he always had a very good voice, even as a as a, a young lad, and he was part of the Holmes uh, choir, which was touring probably around Methodist churches. And uh, he was spotted by the Warnocks in the choir and they made approaches to the home if they could adopt him. Uh, now, his adoptive father was a dentist albeit, I think, what would be regarded as unqualified maybe nowadays, 
uh, he was a dentist and had a practice in Glasgow. So in a way, Edward kind of fell into that. I don't know. I think Mr. Warnock always had the intention that he would he would follow on. Whereas Walter stayed at, in Bethnal Green. And uh, again, he was always very interested in sport and particularly football. Uh, and he developed a career initially uh, in an amateur side and then went on to play, as we said, professionally for Tottenham Hotspur and Northampton Town. So it was really that separation, I suppose, of the two boys that led one into dentistry and the other into a sporting career. OK, what I would say, and you touched on it, is that despite um, these adversities, let's say, the Warnicks were very uh, determined to maintain contact between Edward and Walter. So Walter would come on holiday up to Glasgow and the Warnicks would support that. And therefore that connection continued and increased actually in their adult lives to the point that uh, Walter actually had signed for Glasgow Rangers. Um, there is officer training in the southwest of Scotland as well. Um, so that's how close they were had Walter survived the war. The other thing that I like to emphasize about my grandfather, Edward, who we're talking about, um, when my mum died, I went down to Girvan just on instinct, uh, where he had a practice. Uh, and I met an older couple in a garden and I was talking to them. And they said, oh, they remembered him. He was the footballer. And I thought, well, no, that was my grand uncle. But I underestimated. Edward was a very good footballer. He played for Girvan Athletic. He played for Ayr Parkhouse, who were in the second division, uh, Scottish second division. Um, you know, so he was no mean sportsman in his own right. So it's a remarkable story already then of this young man who, um, as Duncan was saying, almost fell, I suppose, uh, into dentistry whilst his brother has uh, moved into a sporting arena. So in terms of how he got started uh, in dentistry, in terms of beginning that road towards getting his own practice and becoming established and becoming, if you like, trusted as a black man at that time, um, what do you know uh, about the early struggles which he faced? We know um, from an account that my father kept, and I should say that our father was very close to Edward. Um, and my dad kept quite detailed mem memoirs. Uh, and one of those contains the story of Edward applying for his first job, having qualified with, um, having qualified in whenever it was, about 1910. Um, and he, as far as I understand the story, believed he had a post, he had achieved a post in Birmingham and he was congratulated by Mr. Warnock. He was given a watch and celebration of it. Uh, and he had sent a photograph of himself, according to our story, um, in advance. Uh, anyway, he turned up in Birmingham and uh, the dentist opened the door and said along the lines, uh, no, there's been a mistake. And that was the end of that. And Walter returned to Glasgow. Um, so th that's a story that I think that's uh, unequivocal uh, about the kind of uh, racism and discrimination that Edward had to face. He then went up to Aberdeen and worked as a dental assistant in Aberdeen where he met his wife and then came back uh, I don't know the exact detail, possibly following the death of Mr. Warnock and, and took over the practice and established his practice in St. Vincent Street in Glasgow and in Girvan. So was there it the case other Sorry. reflections that I don't know if Duncan wants to touch on that we know in Edward's account to my father, his view about uh, the challenges uh, he faced uh, and he warned our father that he may face in terms of marrying Jean, uh, his only daughter, what well, Edward's only daughter, uh, 
the challenges of being mixed heritage. I don't know if Duncan, you want to say anything further. A, well, only that we know that um, our grandfather uh, politically was what would now be described as a socialist. Uh, and although he himself was sent to private school by Mr. Warnock uh, and then went on to Glasgow University, he, I think he always felt that he had privilege in that. And I don't think he was entirely comfortable with that. But when it came to his own daughter, he said that he, he felt that because she might suffer some kind of uh, discrimination, uh, he decided to send her to private school in Glasgow. That was his justification. Uh, and he also, as I say, was aware, obviously from his own experience, that uh, if his only daughter, Jean, was to marry our father, um, that there may be uh, the children could possibly be uh, coloured. And again, he warned that or made my father aware of that possibility and that he may have to deal with those issues himself. So I think this all comes out of, of his own experience, as I say, inevitably. But he always seemed to manage to overcome these difficulties and, and quite often with a sense of, of humour uh, and I suppose acceptance maybe in a way uh, but nonetheless, he, he had, as I said before, a very successful dental practice in Glasgow. And that, I think, speaks volumes about how he must have been regarded, certainly by his patients. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, when Duncan says sense of acceptance, I mean, I think we'd probably both agree from his character, probably not a sense of acceptance. A, more that his manner was not, my sense is, and I think Duncan's touching on, is that Edward, you do not get a sense that he was outwardly confrontational. Uh, he was the reverse. People really enjoyed his company, uh, felt that he lightened uh, their experience. Um, so, as we were saying a minute ago, there's no question from what he said to my father on his own life experience. He was experiencing discrimination uh, and prejudice, uh, uh, but he rose up in a sense, I suppose, to use the term, my sense is he chose to rise above that. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, Ed, you recounted that story of, of him coming down south and effectively being turned away at the door, then having to, to mm. return to Scotland. Was it the case mm. almost that he felt um, more accepted in Scotland than he did in England and that he felt able to actually pursue his career in Scotland uh, as opposed to coming down south, coming down to England? To be truthful, of course, um, I, I, there's no way I can answer that. Um, I think where Edward, his own father, Daniel, who came from Barbados, uh, Walter, the whole Tull family were very devout Methodists. Um, and that's certainly a very strong thread in all they did and um, the friendships they made. You know, Ed, Edward led the choir. Duncan touched on this earlier. He had an ex exceptional voice. He was an exceptionally good singer, um, beautiful singer. And he led the choir at uh, Claremont Street Methodist Church in Glasgow. Um, so I think he returned to Scotland and I think there was a Med Methodist link when he went to Aberdeen uh, because he certainly he, he joined the Methodist church there. And I think that's how he met his wife, uh, Elizabeth Hutchison. Um, so I, I understand uh, the gist behind your question and I'm, I'm afraid I, I just I just don't know that there is a wee small interesting point for us we have a postcard from walter to edward we think written in advance of edward coming to birmingham 
and Walter goes out of his way to say, be sure to uh, link up with, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but it's a mutual friend, possibly from the children's home, when you get to Birmingham. Um, so there was a sense of, um, I don't know what that was about. I don't know whether it ties in with what you're suggesting, whether that Walter anticipated that Edward would face potential difficulties, hostility. Um, uh, he certainly went out of his way to say to Edward, look, when you come to Birmingham, I'll arrange for whoever this was to meet up with you. Mm -hmm. But as you were saying, Duncan, obviously, uh, upon return uh, to Scotland, he's then opened his own practice and, as you say, he's become uh, a trusted uh, clinician towards his patients. Um, did he face any particular obstacles from uh, other practitioners uh, in the city? Was he? Uh, did he face any particular prejudices from uh, the authorities up there? Was it not easy for him to establish himself? But was it um, something that he was able to do uh, after overcoming challenges? Did he have to overcome a lot of challenges to do so? I can't say for certain, but um, from what we know, it would appear. I mean, he took over his. Uh, I think, as Ed had mentioned before, he took over his father's practice in St Vincent Street. Um, so that might have been easier than setting up his own practice. I mean, one can't imagine that he didn't experience a prejudice because of his colour. Um, in certain aspects, but certainly in terms of of the practice, he managed to take that over and a and and develop it into um, a successful practice, and also extend it down to Gervin. As Ed was saying, he had I think he went down a couple of days a week um, to run that side of it. Uh, he yes, I mean. He seemed to be, from what we gather, very accepted um, in society generally. Uh, we, I think we'd mentioned that he did, he was asked to speak to Professional Dentist Association. And, um, and we have a copy of his, his um, talk to them, typically riddled with his humour. Um, so, and, and we know from, from his extensive uh, network of friends that uh, he seemed to be accepted very largely in a society and as a professional um, within society in Glasgow and round about. Ed may have more to add about specific cases. But. He certainly, um, our mum's recollections are that he was a father who as we've said already, it was was great fun. But he was extremely hard working, um, but he also lived life to the full because, you know, when he wasn't working, he was socialising. He was going to the theatre. He was singing in the choir. He was playing golf. Um, he became the president of Alan Glen's. Alan Glen was a, a very uh, a school of great reputation in Glasgow, which is where Edward was educated. He went on to become the president of the Old Boys Association. He was a member at Turnberry Golf Club when Turnberry Golf Club was not only prestigious, um, uh, but held in high respect. Um, so, you know, Edward led a very full life and uh, in a social sense, he played bridge, played table tennis. Um, Yes, this, there's no sense I have that Edward was in any way living uh, at the side or in some form of um, self-imposed isolation. He was a great socialite. And that comes across in the many letters of condolence uh, that I've read that came through when he died. You mentioned earlier, actually, as well, that um, he was a man uh, who had a very, very strong sense of obviously faith, but also as well uh, was politically aware. Um, he was someone who, um, uh, Duncan, I think you mentioned, would have classed himself as a socialist. Um, did his politics um, play a part in terms of the work that he was doing as well? Obviously, this is we're going to mention as well, I think, uh, shortly about the National Health Service, for instance. Did that was that an important driving part of his work? Yes, definitely professionally it did. 
I mean, he was a strong advocate for the NHS, development of the NHS and, and dentistry within that. Uh, again, as, as, as Ed had indicated, uh, I think Methodism was at the root of that in terms of, of social, economic and racial justice. He felt strongly about these issues. He, he admired people like Paul Robeson greatly and went to hear Paul Robeson um, when he came to speak in Glasgow in the stance that he took. And others who were arguing for racial justice. Uh, and he, uh, he clearly had strong convictions about these, these issues. We also, I think, know that, which may have been common practice, um, I don't know, but he didn't charge unfairly, but I think he did charge um, a good rate for those he felt could afford it in his practice. And he would reduce his rates for those who couldn't. And even on occasion, he would do it for free if he felt that people needed the treatment and, and couldn't afford it. Um, you know, and he fought against issues within dentistry. I know that uh, it had become common practice just because people couldn't afford the treatment uh, in those days, you know, to, to have children's teeth taken out um, regardless, because at the end of the day, that was going to be less expensive than treatment. He would argue against that. He was very conscious of things like the, the how diet affected your teeth and your general health and things like that. So, yes, I mean, uh, he, he did his, his political beliefs, I think, um, affected the way he carried his out his life professionally as well as in his his own particular personal life. Yeah. And I think again, looking at our father's memoirs, where he talks a lot about Edward, uh, he makes the point that Edward was um, delighted, absolutely delighted for the short period in which the National Health Service was coming into being uh, before Edward died in 1950. Uh, I have to say my father was not um, uh, quiet in terms of his politics either. And there's an irony that when he was writing his memoirs in 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, living uh, north of Inverness, uh, he and my mum couldn't get a dentist, an NHS dentist. And my dad reflected that, you know, Walter would be, to say the least, disappointed, possibly really angry that we'd come to that uh, in a relatively short period of time. So um, certainly from my dad's reflections, I think there's no doubt that Walter welcomed the National Health Service and had very strong views about the importance that health is free at the point of entry. Ed, sorry, just to, to save confusion, you mentioned Walter twice. Oh, that's Edward. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Duncan. It's just as well you're there. I did mean Edward. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. Um, one other question, just slightly askance on that one then. So um, in terms of his patients, the composition of his of his patients, and I appreciate this will be a difficult one for you, uh, for either of you to answer perhaps, but um, do we know um, uh, if he had patients, uh, if all of his patients, for instance, were white, or did he have patients of colour, uh, uh, brown or black patients, patients of uh, mixed heritage? I certainly am not aware of the, you know, the, the kind of makeup of his practice in terms. I would suspect, compared to Glasgow now, uh, yeah, it would. There would be relatively few, for instance, people of. Um, Asian background or Afro-Caribbean, um, it, it's changed obviously, but uh, I think then there would be far less people of mixed heritage there. Yeah. Although one has to be cautious because like Liverpool, Bristol, certainly Liverpool, you know, Glasgow's uh, imperialistic and shipping history. Uh, meant that the population of Glasgow was pretty cosmopolitan, I think even in Edward's time. Mm. So 
I'd actually be quite surprised if you didn't come across people that were mixed heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know from a mum's account um, that St Vincent Street at that stage, you know, they lived in a kind of large flat on various floors and the, the dental mechanic, <laughs> forgot his name, we've got a photograph of him, he was in the basement, but they were surrounded by traditional Glasgow tenements. Uh, and from my mum's own account, you know, tenements of extreme poverty. Uh, so, you know, which I think would be right for that period, 20s, 30s, 40s in Glasgow. Do we know uh, from any of the stories or recollections um, if his time, obviously he spent a, a long time in dentistry, do we know if he felt there had been changes in the profession by the time uh, he was towards the end of his time uh, in the profession versus at the start in terms of his level of acceptance, for instance, in terms of any barriers which he might have faced? Uh, was it easier for him at the end than it was at the start? I, I'm afraid I just... I can't answer that. I don't have information. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the facts said several times that he had a successful practice uh, indicates that after his initial start, we mentioned about Birmingham, he went to Aberdeen and then back down to Glasgow and he was able to build a practice up there. I think things would have got better again. Uh, as I said, his his uh, his adoptive father uh, was an unqualified dentist, and obviously, um, in Edward's case, he went to to Glasgow University and and, and qualified. Uh, and I would imagine that would have within the profession that would have been something that was happening more and more often. Uh, also, the fact that. Um, The, the NHS came into being uh, within his lifetime, uh, which would have in, in, included, obviously, dentistry. That much more comprehensively, I would imagine, at that stage was something that he really rejoiced in. Yep. OK, so as we move forward, then, obviously, now um, we are uh, having this discussion uh, as part of the GDC, General Dental Council's marking of Black History Month. Uh, we're in an age now of uh, uh, Black History Month and Black Lives Matter, uh, and it's something which obviously wouldn't have been around at all uh, to any extent whatsoever uh, back at his time. Um, again, difficult for you to be able to answer this one perhaps, but uh, in terms of the implications of Black History Month and marking events such as this uh, and Black Lives Matter. Um, given his political views and given his um, uh, his views on society, how, how do you think he would have felt about all this? A, I, I'm sure that he obviously would have been a strong supporter um, of Black History Month and of uh, Black Lives Matter. But I think it would probably sadden him to know that these issues, um, you know, still exist and, and even possibly uh, are more of an issue uh, in present society. That uh, I would have imagined he would have hoped that things would have progressed and that, that uh, within society there'd be much more acceptance of diversity and it, obviously in some ways that that is true but there are areas clearly where progress has been very slow um and 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 obviously even from time to time it's had setbacks so yes i mean i was watching last night a a, a program um dealing with the race issue and particularly, as I say, I think in in, uh, in the 1960s in Britain, and I have to say, uh, I was horrified by some of the facts and figures, you know, that I was hearing. So, yes, things have moved on, but there's still obviously a great deal to be done. And I think, uh, as I say, Edward would have 
would have been a strong supporter of these two initiatives, campaigns. Yeah. And I suppose your question would make me reflect that although uh, Black History Month, Black Lives Matters, we view as more contemporary movements and events, um, thinking about Edward's life and history, and again, my dad's memoirs reflecting that, they were attending rallies, as Duncan said earlier, uh, involving Paul Robeson. Um, there is a lot of reference to both racism in this country, the, the need to address that, um, uh, and reflections about the kind of apartheid that existed in America uh, and South Africa, a great consciousness over that. He was also had contact with, and I think was a, a friend of um, Harold Moody, um, who I think established, and I, forgive me, I'm going to, I'm not going to get the title of the movement. So perhaps Wayne, you might be able to keep me right here. It was the League of, I want to say, Achievement of Coloured People. It's a cumbersome title, and it does reflect the time. Uh, you know that reference to coloured people, um, uh, and it, and it was probably by some people um, not viewed as being radical enough. But these were the kind of movements that Edward was involved in and aligned to. So some of this wouldn't be at all new. And as Duncan says, if anything, I think from what I understand about the character of Edward, he would be more saying to us, why have you not come further? Uh, and why are you not doing more to uh, you know, address ongoing uh, very serious issues? Sadly, I think the last few years, the whatever it is, uh, only reminds us that um, we've got to be very careful about the assumption that we're making progress because what we're seeing and hearing um, is very challenging. Okay, so to close then, if I could ask um, both of you for one reflection or one thing you'd like people to maybe take away from what they've heard today uh, in terms of uh, your grandfather uh, and maybe finding out more about him and his contribution. Um, what was it that you'd like to finish with, if I can say, uh, Ed first? I think I'll go back to those letters of condolence that I read some time ago and how frequently from such a diverse group of people uh, and sources, the constant remark about Edward was he brightened people's lives. Uh, when he joined their company, uh, you always felt better after being in Edward's company. Now that's a pretty, um, you know, that's a, that's a, a good memory to have and quite an accolade, I think, to a character, particularly one who would have had every reason to be pretty angry and resentful of uh, the world, maybe as he'd experienced it, um, when that was in terms of racism or adversity, in terms of the early losses in his life. So I think to come through as a person of that kind of character, that's what I would want to remember. He lightened people's lives. People felt the better of being in his company. Excellent. And for you, Duncan? Uh, yes, that would be very true, what, what Ed has said, but, uh, and both in, in the case of, of Walter and Edward. Um, the incredible resilience that they showed in their lives, overcoming adversity, the loss of both of their parents, um, being put into children's homes, then being separated. Uh, and yet they both achieved a great deal within their lives. Um, what, what brought about that? I'm not sure. I mean, they obviously their early childhood was been important. They must have had a very good and loving early childhood. Um, I think the the Methodist Church for them was very important. Um, and as we mentioned, you know, various stages in their lives played an important part. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it, it, you know, 
it, it shows incredible strength of character to have come through all they did and to have achieved so much in their lives without any, as Ed said, any kind of resentment or bitterness and things, the, the very opposite, really. Uh, their way of overcoming adversity seemed to be to achieve against the odds. So, yeah, great pride in both of them and their lives. Yeah. OK, well, uh, two remarkable men, uh, Walter Tull and Edward Tull Warnock. And uh, obviously today the focus has been mainly on uh, hearing more about Edward. Um, all I can say is, uh, Ed, Duncan, thank you so much for your time, uh, both today and also in the uh, preceding uh, weeks in terms of getting this put together. Been really, really appreciative, appreciative uh, of what you've done for us. Uh, and uh, hopefully people will find this as fascinating to listen to um, as uh, I found it listening to the two of you today. So thank you very much to both of you. No, we thank the General Dental Council for taking an interest in Edward's story. Yeah. And, uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Wayne.